Can we end it to our last session for today? Can we go to the same? Let's do the logo. If when I first saw the name, it sounded like a city to me. I'm actually when it's translated, it means the monk. Okay. So I should go to a monastery. Where can we get one of your entanglement kits? I could use one. They're for sale. We're going fast. Afterwards, yes. Thank you. I feel like uh, I'm back in uh, uh, college again because here I felt like I was cramming for an exam trying to prepare this talk. But uh, today I'd like to talk about quantum entanglement and uh, basically from the perspective of the charges. And uh, this is work in progress. And, uh, and so uh, I'll put these PowerPoint slides on my website. And I'd like to begin uh, uh, to mention that quantum entanglement is very much like uh, a, uh, uh, very much reminds me of a story by G.K. Chesterman. Uh, G.K. Chesterman, many years ago, wrote a, uh, a short story. And basically, he was on the train. He heard melody. And it was so beautiful, he kept uh, whistling it, repeating it in his mind. He had heard someone else listening in. Uh, he was on a train, he got off the train, and he continued to uh, play this melody in his head and to whistle it. He went home. The next day, he was doing the same thing. And the day after, he was doing the same thing. And soon, he became very haggard. He didn't know what to do. How in the world can he possibly uh, get rid of this tune that just keeps running around in his head? And finally, he had an idea. And so immediately, he went over to see a friend of his and conveyed the tune to him. And G.J. Chesterton was cured. Okay, he passed it on to someone else. Well, the reason I mention this story is that quantum entanglement can be uh, quite uh, uh, habit forming. You have to be very careful. Uh, it'll just constantly go around in your head. It's a very difficult topic, at least for me. And uh, in fact, uh, this actually, if you, um, just well, my sound is off, I see. This is supposed to be another joke about an amber warning that immediately I mentioned the word quantum entanglement, and there is a system that came up. And uh, basically, I'd just like to uh, point out this far side of part two. <laughs> I think it's really a fun So be careful. Okay, so let's continue but with caution. Um, so uh, in this talk, we will not be talking about LOCC, uh, local operations, with classical communication, or SLOCC, uh, stochastic local operations with classical communication. In other words, we will not discuss classical communication issues in regard to entangled quantum systems. Uh, that's a separate talk. OK. Um, uh, we focus solely on in-qubit systems. We want to fo focus on the essential ideas and on pure states. Okay. Uh, H will denote the underlying Hilbert space of our n-qubit quantum system. And psi will denote the underlying uh, pure state, which can be written as a linear combination of standard basis vectors, the z sub j's, or complex amplitudes. OK, here we have. Uh, a state of an n-qubit quantum system. We will use the identification of uh, the following uh, uh, identification. We'll identify each integer with a binary string. We'll go back and forth. This will make the equation is much simpler. 
So if you have the number five, you can identify it with the string 101, and so forth. Under this identification, we'll use the following notation. This denotes the integer formed by actually complementing the kth bit. That's what the notation means. So I'm just going to, we'll come back to that later. Okay. Uh, Moore's theorem, for each lead group symmetry, G, of a physical system, uh, there exists a, a naturally associated conserved quantity called an Arthur charge. An example of this, uh, we're all aware of, uh, to a physical system, cis system, um, invariant under a lead group G of rigid translations of free space, is associated a conserved charge which we all know as momentum. That's <coughs> uh, the physical system is invariant under uh, rigid translations of free space. Well, we're going to do essentially the same thing, well, in with quantum entanglement. You can think of quantum entanglement as a result of the symmetry. And uh, our lead group G will act on the system, transforming the system in itself, just as a translation of a mechanical system uh, translates it into itself. And we will associate to that a charge, which is a map of the state of the system into the real numbers. It's a real value system. So you can think of momentum. Uh, as a real number for each component of it. Uh, and uh, essentially on the left we have a Lie symmetry and because of the Gilbert theorem of Emmy Norther, uh, we have a conserved charge that's naturally associated with the system. All right, now I'd just like to backtrack just a little bit and uh, just use sort of a uh, an example of how all these ideas evolved. First of all, uh, one way of thinking about quantum entanglement is through factoring. This is the simplest form of definition. Uh, we let psi be the state of the quantum system, and then the quantum system is entangled, provided is not entangled, excuse me. I meant that should be not entangled. Uh, no, excuse me, it is entangled if and only if it can't be factored, the state can't be factored into the tensor product of two states. This is one of the simplest definitions, uh, but not, in my opinion, not the best. In fact, there's a paper by that Lou and I wrote on uh, entitled Entanglement Criteria, Quantum and Topological. It's on archive, and what it does is the following. It associates with the qubit quantum system a family of polynomials. And uh, in this paper, uh, it's shown that uh, this system is not entangled if all the above polynomials are zero. I see you've got a typo here. Okay, uh, here's an example of this uh, theorem. We have n equals three qubits. Here is our um, state vector written as a sum of complex amplitudes and the standard basis, then the quantum system is not entangled if and only if this very simple set of equations uh, is not equal to zero. Okay. So in a certain sense, this reduces the problem uh, of studying entanglement to studying algebraic varieties. Okay, another stage, is, which is kind of interesting, um, which I find it interesting, Understanding quantum entanglement through quantum computing devices. And uh, essentially, this was a talk I gave at uh, Porto Novo. And a quantum system is entangled, provided one can associate with the system a quantum computing device which cannot be simulated by any classical device whatsoever, which is sometimes hard to prove. And this is one way of getting at this. And this appeared in, um, in the Porter Noble um, uh, proceedings and also in the following information processes, processing uh, journal. And it's on the archive, it's open domain. And here's the example. This device cannot be simulated by any classical device. And in the paper, we actually prove this 
Therefore, we have quantum entanglement. So it's a, a certain measure. And I have a PhD student working on this, associating different computing devices with various entangled states. All right, now the third approach is the one I'd like to talk about, and that's the northern charge approach. So we'll consider <coughs> an in qubit quantum system um, whose state vector lies in a in dimensional, a two to the n dimensional Hilbert space for n qubits. And uh, the local unitary group is defined as follows. It's simply uh, the unitary transformation uh, um, that each individual, that each qubit, we could place an Alice sub 1, sub 2, and so forth, each of the qubits. And these are all the local operations that can be performed. And we'll call this a local regroup, and this lies inside the unitary group of uh, all transformations on the space. So ultimately, what we're trying to do is create a uh, representation of the algebra of this local group, and we'll see how we use it. OK. Two states, we say, have the same entanglement provided and go from the two states, one to the other, by applying only local operations. So this is an equivalence relation. Uh, if, the, if and only if there exists a local transformation, which takes one from the other. So if we have an Alice, each qubit, each Alice is allowed to apply a uh, unitary transformation uh, to her qubit. And uh, we end up with the same amount of entanglement. Uh, two states, psi 1 and psi 2, are of uh, the same entanglement type. Oh, I just gave that definition. Okay. We define the entanglement classes. It's an equivalence relation. And essentially, what we're uh, studying is these classes, and we'd like to find invariants, which define a complete set of invariants, which define these classes of uh, states. So, uh, for instance, if you work with an EPR pair, uh, we have a cal. Here. We see what are examples of local equivalent states. Well, we have 0, 0, plus 1, 1. I won't even normalize it. Uh, that's locally equivalent to 0, 0, minus 1, 1, or 0, 1, plus 1, 0, and uh, 0, 1, minus uh, 1, 0. Those are all locally equivalent states, and they have the same entanglement. And if it weren't for that fact, we would not have. Uh, uh, teleportation. Teleportation actually uses that fact. Okay, uh, we define the entanglement class. Here it is. It's basically a set of all um, state vectors in our Hilbert space H, uh, which are equivalent to a given a given state. So we, uh, we have now a very uh, decomposition of the Hilbert space into uh, uh, disjoint blocks which cover the entire space. Of the space. Uh, please refer to, I don't see, what is this? Oh, if you would like more about this, in, there's a paper I wrote entitled a, An Entangled Tale of Quantum Entanglement, where I uh, actually studied the entanglement classes of density operators. But today we'll just restrict ourselves to state vectors, I think, uh, and, uh, but if you're interested, you can look at that paper. Okay, uh, Norman's theorem. For each Lie group symmetry G of a physical system S, there exists a naturally associated conserved charge, uh, the Norman charge F. And uh, uh, essentially, the entanglement, you have a natural symmetry, a very fragile one, it can easily be broken, but nonetheless, it's a, a Norman symmetry of the system. So uh, we'll consider an n qubit quantum system where the Local Lie group acts on the Hilbert space of that system into itself. This is our Lie symmetry. And we'll associate with that a conserved charge. And we'd like a complete set of conserved charges, which uh, will actually uh, tell us everything we need to know about the entangled state. OK, consider an n qubit quantum system. And with this Lie symmetry, I just mentioned this. Our objective now is to compute northern charges associated with the entanglement classes. And more than that, our objective is to find a complete set. 
Okay. Uh, well, let I be the 2 by 2 identity matrix and X, Y, and Z, the standard uh, poly spin operators. So now what we can do is uh, let L of N denote the local group and uh, lowercase L of N denote the corresponding the algebra. And uh, we'll be working with those objects. The infinitesimal generators of the local Lie group, it's well known, are the following. They're essentially, uh, let's see, did I write down the formula for the, the first one? The first one up there, let's see, what is this mark? Uh, this is just the uh, 2 to the n by 2 to the n identity matrix of i along the di times i. Uh, that's one generator. And uh, the other infinitesimal generators are, are constructed as follows. And as it turns out, we really don't need uh, this particular generator because uh, that will correspond to an overall phase change, which is physically undetectable, and hence physically meaningless, but we'll leave it in there nonetheless. Um, we'll let uh, f be a, uh, basically a smooth function. Like, uh, from the Hilbert space into the real numbers, and for each i m, each element of the Lie algebra, we can define a directional derivative. Okay, and here it is, very simply defined. This is uh, basically the rate of change in the direction i sub m. The elements of the Hilbert space are really uh, uh, directional derivatives. You can think about them that way, the Lie algebra. Now, if we do that, then uh, a smooth map is a larger northern charge if and only if it satisfies all of these equations. And there are three n plus one such equations. We have basically it's a system of partial differential equations uh, whose solution consists of all the invariants of our uh, entanglement class. Okay. Uh, these, I'll call these the, uh, I thought I put entanglement, but I'll call these the northern, northern entanglement equations. All right, consider uh, uh, a uh, smooth map from Hilbert space into R, where uh, basically the state of the space is given by uh, that expression. The ZJs are just amplitudes. Uh, and let's note something. And let's note that, uh, denote by uh, xj and yj the real and complex components of the amplitudes. Okay. And we'll let z simply denote a column vector of the complex amplitudes, and x and y will denote column vectors of the real and com imaginary parts of uh, the, the vector. And, uh, that tells us that basically our northern charges are functions of uh, all the uh, real components of the amplitude and all the imaginary components. I need to do this for a reason. It'd be nice if I could work totally within the complex numbers, but the uh, the algebra of uh, uh, the unitary group or the local group also uh, is a real Lie algebra. So we have to be careful the functions that are invariants are not necessarily uh, analytic functions. And that we'll work around. Observe that x, in xy coordinates, the northern charge equations are complicated and unwieldy. That's a real problem. However, surprisingly, they simplify if we look at them in another coordinate system. That's what I'm going to try to do today. Um, in what I call the amplitude adjoint amplitude coordinates, I'll take the vector of complex amplitudes and the adjoint vector. And I'll consider, now we consider, well, I should have written an equation here. So now we can think of um, F, uh, we, oh, uh, we can think of our function f of x, y as a function of z and z adjoint. 
doesn't look like you've done much, but some things amazingly simplify at this point. Uh, let's see, how does this work? Any questions? All right, and amplitude adjoint coordinates, here we have uh, these equations uh, will define two well, vector fields, partial with respect to zj. It's just a linear combination of the uh, real and imaginary vector fields and the adjoint vector fields. Now, these partials are not partial derivatives, so we need to be a little careful because z and z uh, bar are not necessary, are not independent of one another. But nonetheless, there are vector fields and their derivations, so as long as we're careful, we can use them. So, uh, these are, I'm actually, here's the warning I gave. And we'll let dz, or delta, I couldn't find del on my uh, PowerPoint, so I had to use a delta. This is the gradient uh, with respect to the uh, z vector. And there's the adjoint of that, a gradient with respect to the um, complementary uh, the conjugate z's. And of course, uh, the first gradient is a column vector, the second gradient, no, row vector, excuse me, and the second is a column vector. We need to be careful about covariant and contravariant objects. Uh, theorem. Uh, let's take an arbitrary element of our Lie algebra. Then essentially, you can prove that in the z coordinates of uh, the uh, direction derivative in the direction on m is basically that that expression is a linear combination of the two different gradients. Those transposes are there. Uh, at first, I, that bothered me a lot, but they have to be there because we have some non-commutative algebras involved in this, and we've got to be very careful. So that's it. It's a very simple formula. Let's see where we, where it leads us in the z z adjoint. Uh, coordinates, the northern charge equations are as follows. And here they are. Um, uh, and uh, basically, this is a list of those equations. Uh, let's see, is there one missing? No. Uh, you know, this first equation is an infinitesimal uh, move, or the derivative is an infinitesimal uh, uh, move in. The direction which just changes the overall uh, amplitude of the system is basically undetectable. But the others, there are three and other directions given by those derivatives. Notice how simple the formulas are. But maybe I should explain uh, some of the notation here earlier. Notice that I have this funny notation here, and that is I take the integer j, identify it as a binary vector, and complement the kth bit. And we then interpret that as an integer. And that's the operator, which is an infinitesimal bit flip. The second operator, the y operator, is an infinitesimal bit flip and phase flip. And uh, given by this expression, here we are using this. But now we'll take minus 1, we'll take the kth bit of j, and we'll change the sign. And uh, the last one is an infinitesimal phase flip. And then now we're just changing the sign if gk is 1. So these are the operators. And plus, the other part is just the adjoint. It's the same expression, the, ad the adjoint of the same expression. So we need, need to even write them. What amazed me in, uh, when I uh, made this calculation that everything simplified. I found the uh, other equations in terms of x and y very mystified. And uh, this uh, couldn't make heads or tails of the x and x y coordinates. But these, are, these seem to be natural. You can actually remember them because you can see what they do. Um, now, for n equal 2 qubits, let's take a look and see what they look like. And I'll just write down a set of equations. And here's the first set of equations. Um, and you'll, if you look at them, you can see, let's look at the first one. Uh, this is an infinitesimal bit flip, and you're flipping the first bit. So if you take 
zero, zero, and you flip the first bit of that, you'll get one zero, or uh, excuse me, you'll get zero, one. And you flip the, sec uh, the first bit of one, of uh, zero, one, you'll get zero, zero, or zero, and so forth. So it's very easy to remember. Uh, in this case, this is, well, let's look at, uh, this should be a Z. I'm sorry about that, that's a typo. This is a Z. And uh, you'll notice that this is a simple phase flip. Um, and uh, if the uh, first bit is 1, it's minus. And, and if the first bit is 0, it's plus. It's very simple to remember. And uh, here's this uh, infinitesimal um, uh, overall phase change. Let me think about that. And here's another uh, seven year of transformations. There are actually seven generators. This is a basically a seven dimensional Lee algebra. And this is a complete set of generators. And uh, let's see if I can point. Now, once again, we're not changing, we're flipping the uh, second bit. So if we flip the second bit of zero, zero, uh, where am I? We'll get one zero or two. Flip the second bit of zero, one, we'll get three. Well, it's not easy to argue the number. I was, I was really surprised at that. In this case, this is a both. We're, uh, we're flipping and uh, bit flips and phase flips, and you can see how that works. This is a simple phase flip. So when the, um, um, the second bit of the index is one, the minus sign, minus one to the j sub k. And that's it. It's very simple. And uh, now I'm working on using these sets of equations. I think I have a conjecture as to what a complete set of invariants is based on these equations, but I'm, uh, um, uh, that'll be part of my next talk. So basically, that's it. Any questions you have? Thank you very much. Yes? How do your equations relate to the I looked at them, and there's some interesting things going on with those equations. First of all, the state of a quantum system is in complex projective space. So those polynomials are really projective polynomials. Let's see, where is that? That's very at the very beginning. Uh, here, let's look at this set of equations. Whoops, I don't know what happened here. And now, my mouse is on. Let's see if I can turn this on. Okay, here's the set of equations for two qubits. So very easy to write. You'll notice that uh, the same, uh, uh, if you look at, think of these in terms of, uh, the integers in terms of bits, you can actually write down the equations. Z3 is simply 1, 1. So that's basically a combination of 1, 0, which is 2, and 0, 1, which is 1. That's how you get the first equation. 5 is 1, 0, 1. And you'll notice that that's a, a product, that's essentially the product of 0, 1, uh, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0, 0, and so forth. You can get the set of equations. Um, these are not invariants because they're, they're not zeros of the thing. I, I was hoping, in fact, when I started this, I thought, this is perfect. We've got a nice set of equations that could be invariants, but they're not. But you'll notice that these uh, polynomials live in the following ring, in uh, the ring uh, over complex numbers, I guess, um, uh, which consists of uh, z, z inverse, and actually there's the par corresponding complementary one, z bar and z bar inverse, the adjoints, okay. Uh, they live there. 
So you can uh, multiply them by an arbitrary uh, power of any of the z's. And when you write, uh, you do that, you'll notice that if you divide the first one by uh, z0 squared, you get the following equation. Uh, That's the first one. And uh, essentially, the first one says that z3 over uh, z0 is z1 over z0 and z2 over z0. And uh, z5 is the same over z0 is the same as uh, z1 over z0. And maybe we get too technical. And z4 uh, over z0. And so forth. These are projected polynomials. And I would like to use these to create an invariant. There must be a way of doing that. I looked at the ideal generated by these and these links, but that's still not an invariant. Yeah, so I think, I think that's all what one wants to do is take your equations and write them down and then compare what this system is saying. They yes. aren't directly isomorphic in any way. But they do complementary things. Yeah. This says it's not entangled, yeah. and the other yeah, says that's it is. What I mean. So they need yeah. some comparison. That's oh. good. That's a good question. Um, another question is one that I've puzzled about for a while. I just you, there are some quantum spaces you run into, and they aren't in any natural way a tensor product of qubit spaces, like the spaces in the Fibonacci model. They're not. Right. They're not given that way. Mm -hmm. And so then you're sure that there's entanglement going on on the in the operators that you know there. But what what the heck do I really mean by entanglement? On this space, where it isn't, it isn't written as a tensor product in, in the natural. Way. We have a basis of the space. We could use that basis. It, yeah, but it's not a tensor basis. Uh, I guess what you have to do is use C star algebra as a way of defining it, defining entanglement in terms of those. Uh, let's see. There's someone whose whose who's last name is a flower. I'm trying to remember. Uh, well, in your talk, you mentioned different concepts of entanglement, right? Yeah. And some of them, like, you know, what kind of devices would live on that space? And then That's right. you, you would see from that that, uh, that certain that entanglement was going on, an external point of view. It might be that one could use, really use that to detect what's going on with those spaces. Good idea. I was sort of hoping to do. I have a student working using the devices. If you have an entangled space, space you can do quantum, uh, uh, computational work with it. Each one does a different kind of computational work uh, coming from different entangled classes. Uh, I don't fully understand that, but I know that yeah, some of I'd like a different definition of entanglement, and then, and then the theorem would be, and the braiding operators in the Fibonacci model are entangling operators under such and such. Right. Yeah. Sorry, this is a technical remark we're following in here, yeah. Yeah, we need to talk about that. That's very interesting. Uh, there's entanglement going on. You're using it. But somehow it's written in a funny form. But the C-Store algebra definition. definition, which I haven't mentioned, I think is the way to go. Yes? Um, I understand very, very little of this. Um, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's not your fault. Um, so, but I kind of was, you know, stay with it and kind of come in and out and I really like Emmy Nurses, so I've got really, you know about this nurse. Well, she's an amazing person. An amazing person. Uh, what I was trying to come to the picture up just at the end was this thing about for n, for n two qubits there was a seven dimensional Lie algebra. Yes. And I'm just wondering, is this sort of like, like for n is three qubits, then is there a, uh, some, is there a natural certain number, uh, integral dimensional algebra? Well, you, you just count the number of infinitesimal generators, so for n qubits, the Lie algebra is of dimension 3n plus 1. Uh -huh. And that grows linearly, whereas the uh, in Hilbert space is growing exponentially. Oh, right. And there's a crossover point, which is kind of interesting. I think it's uh, when you have more than uh, uh, six or more qubits, some unusual things happen in quantum entanglement. Some unusual things are going on. It's amazing. This does sound very, very interesting. Right. You know, Emmy Nordner is amazing to me. 
She did so much brilliant work that she was not given a position to get in. That was a great crime. I think it was a great crime. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and she was better than the, the people that were trying to judge her there, I think. <laughs> but Hilbert tried to keep her there, but he was unsuccessful. Right. When did she come to the United States? I don't know. Was it just before the war? Uh, I don't think it was before the war. No, I mean, maybe it was earlier. I think it was yeah, after. It was earlier than that. After? Why? Yeah. Oh, it's Vassar's work in the winter, I think. Is that it? I'm trying to remember. Which is, so what's one of those colleges? Amazing person here, and she did so much. And so many different areas, not just one, but many. Yeah, I really like, I just remember reading about her life that she used to, yeah, whatever she was working on, like, so with her students, she'd come in and, like, whatever she was supposed to be doing, she'd go, well, uh, hey, hang on, I've just been discovering this, and I'm going to tell you about that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I wish my English lectures were like that. Have you ever expanded a bit on your use of the term adjoint? Adjoint? Yes. Uh, I guess in, there are many ways of, of defining it, and category theory is a, is a, a categorical adjoint. I'm just, uh, in this case, I'm just looking at a column vector, yeah. and its conjugate transpose is an adjoint. Okay. It's an adjoint operator we use all the time in quantum mechanics. Yes, it's a generator. Is it linked to a generator? No, it's just a transposition. Conjugate transpose, you look at that way. Yeah. But you can define it abstractly without coordinates. And uh, I'm amazed, I was looking at a book on category theory the other day, and they were defining uh, uh, the adjoint functor and so forth. You can yeah. do some weird things there. Yeah, Nick is a, a category theoretician. Oh, you are? Oh, I see. Okay, well, I need your help. I need your help. <laughs> I like to see definitions in different areas. I'm thinking more concretely, but you understand it at that level. That would be good to, to talk about. Any other questions? No. Well, I mean, unless you want to say some more about the interesting things that happen, um, that N is greater than six cubits, but I don't know whether we've got time for that. I'm not sure what our... Well, uh, we basically, the same as the hours, up in 15 uh, minutes' okay. time. Yeah. Okay. Up in 15 minutes' time, we started at 5, so, yeah. you know, yeah. it's yeah. so to be keeping the best. Okay, fine. Yeah. 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 But thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, giving a presentation of this group. I look forward to the other talks, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.